Not all bread is created equal. And if you like your soft, fluffy, moist, and delicious, then Hero Bread and Buns should be your first choice. But Hero Bread isn't just about taste and texture. It's high in fiber with ultra-low net carbs with zero grams of sugar. Order today at Hero.co and use the code AH10 to get 10% off your first purchase. That's AH10 at Hero.co. H-E-R-O dot C-O for 10% off your first purchase. Mark Thompson. Get woke. God bless you. Good morning. Get woke. Ladies and gentlemen, MIP is COVID free. Free meaning you don't need a subscription to hear MIP every day now for a limited time. While we endure this pandemic, we want to make it available to everyone. So wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, MIP is COVID free and available to you and everyone without a subscription. Ladies and gentlemen, as difficult as it may be, be to believe it was 60 years ago July 16th 1960 that the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson senior was arrested for the first time in his life committing an act of civil disobedience and we have Reverend Jackson here now to share that experience with us Reverend Jackson how you doing, man? Very well, sir. Congratulations on your 60th anniversary. First of all, a, a lot of people don't know the story. They know about you at a and But before you went to a and you went to the University of Illinois, right? Well, there as a football player, and actually what happened was I was in a senior speech class, and I had to do a speech with 25 annotated bibliographers. I was home for the first time, and, and I went to the color library. They didn't, didn't have enough books. So you go to the, the, the downtown, I, my friend will give you the books. I got there, and two police were with her, and they were laughing. I thought it was not coincidental. And she said, I'll give them to you in a week. I said, I, I, it's just two of us. I, let me get them the net. This year, what she said, and I got the message. I, I cried. I was hurt. Leave my friends the first time I hadn't seen them in, in six months. So that summer, that, that, that January actually, Jack Robinson came to Greenville during a state NAACP convention. Mrs. Hall at the at, at airport refused to sit in the public section because it was dirty. And so that was a Reverend Hall of 1,500 people, January the 1st. The city in Greenville was February the 1st. So it's a pregnant moment, Mark. In July the 16th, we gathered, eight of us gathered together at Springfield Baptist Church, Reverend Hall was pastor. Went to the, li- went to the library, we were arrested. Uh, and, and you went there. Uh, at the time, were, it's, were black students even allowed to stay in the library or, or be in there for any length of time? No, no. M- m- matter of fact, there was not a single black policeman, the deputy sheriff, the highway patrolman. You live in a race bubble. In your, in your bubble, you may develop a comfort zone. You know, you're equally separate. The resources are equal. You know, Christians are having segregated dreams, segregated ambitions. We felt good about ourselves, but our conditions were quite limited. And it's interesting. You were just there for knowledge and education. You went there to, to get books for your homework assignment, and that was denied you. Well, actually, you know, in slavery time, uh, we got taught reading is the key to revolution. Literacy is the key to liberation. It's interesting that most of our school is around libraries and, and transportation. 
you rewrite count and, and move is not compatible with slavery. Right. It, it, it can't coexist. Did you ever, did you know then that you'd be going to jail for 60 years thereafter? Did you imagine that? Well, I didn't. It was really somewhat impulsive. You know, we were, we hit the outer edges of segregation. There's no black working downtown at J.C. Prince of Bucks and selling clothes. We couldn't sell shoes. We didn't own the service. We just locked out. But again, we developed a comfort zone. So once I was, I lost my fear of jails and death that day. I remember coming home, uh, and I felt good about what we had done, and my dad was sitting in the, in the uh, street in the number two tub with action. And so I thought he'd be happy that he was afraid the house would be bombed, the mother would be killed, and the beauty shop next door. I learned my courage from him. So I thought they would be proud of what I had done, but dad, in fact, was afraid that if we, uh, in fact, protested, that we would be bombed. And eventually, they did burn our high school down. You all were arrested on that day. How long did they keep you in jail, Reverend? It was a process, in two thousand a process, and they put us in jail per se. Okay. Uh, I, the reason I, I, I was slow to talk about it, I can't brag about it too much. We, we were told in the orientation, the Christians don't, don't respond, they uh, put a cigarette in their neck, take it. Be not about be disciplined. We were, we were prepared for the worst. You probably rest. We got that, and the police said, "Now, uh, by the count of three, if you don't leave, we're going to arrest you." One, two, we turned around, went back to church. We all said, "Why well, get back? They got arrested." He said, "Hell, I sent you to get arrested." We went back the second time. <laughs> 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 yeah, I made me go to jail, and so uh, really, it was an exciting moment in our lives, and. I was talking to six of my classmates in jail meetings last night. Oh, really? Yeah, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, we're going to have a, a, a conference. With, I, want, I want you to be on this with the telephone because they don't have Zoom down the green bay yet. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. Tomorrow at 3 o'clock Eastern time, we're going to talk about the experience with them. I mean, we, we couldn't apply to Clemson. My receiver, well, one, one of our uh, mates, you know, the, the professor at Clemson, Another one, another one, the first Baptist University of South Carolina. So really, we were, we were chosen well. We had the discipline to take on the fight. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the bug, the bug bit you then, didn't it? Yeah, it became a struggle for dignity. Uh, I went to A&T that fall. Yes, sir. The citizens had gone to A&T February the first, but by that fall, you know, they were back as usual. And SNCC was formed that spring. In, in Raleigh at Shaw University, uh, John Lewis and, and Julian Vaughn and Baron Barron and uh, Alvin Dawson and Dan Nash and Ella Home Norton, that group. And uh, and so it's interesting, we were thinking about sitting in a green bill. Nashville planning to it with Jim Lawson, Jane Bevel, and Bernard Lafayette. Greensboro did it. Like, Two hundred mile radius. It was a pregnant moment in time, and I think we represent our, our, our generation well. So we, we stayed. We, we hooked up at SCLC with Dr. King. And I was the NAACP youth member at the time, and the public accommodation bill was a, a slightly. You know, the, the day he gave the speech in Washington, from from, uh, from Texas to Florida to Maryland, we could use a single public toilet. My high school class can take a picture on state London State Capitol. Uh, and I think about where we are today. Black males in Montgomery, Alabama, and South Alabama, and Birmingham, Alabama. So the king never saw a black man in Atlanta. Yeah. We've had, we had four since he was killed. Yeah. Um, and what, what it means to have 60 blacks in the country. We were last elected last Tuesday in New York and, and, and in Virginia. And that's because for the first time in this way, some whites began to vote for blacks the first time. These guys won the majority of white districts. There's something afoot now that's, that's worth embracing. 
do you see in many of the young people today in this moment of reckoning, Black Lives Matter and all that, people still out demonstrating in the street. Um, our friend Tamika Mallory um, uh, arrested to try to get Breonna Taylor's killers arrested just on yesterday. Um, do you see the activism of this generation as similar to what you did 60 years ago? Yeah, most be applauded. One thing we did, we, we connected with, it. We, we, we didn't start something new, we, we extended something. That's important because SNCC started, it didn't last. Palace didn't last. Those who were connected to Dr. King was connected to the National Baptist Convention. Kicked out some of the convention, but my point is, who must last? Our, our movement must, must have roots, must have depth, survive the long haul. But this generation of protests is magnificent. I appreciate every moment of it. And I march wherever I can. Yes, sir. And we appreciate you still marching. But, but see what concerns me about Louisville, Brandon Taylor, 60 is the home of Ali. The center of the center of West Louisville is not, is not, doesn't have internet. Yeah. So while we focus on the police, be careful. Police represent the epidermis, the outer layer. This thing is bone deep. And inheritance and access means more effort and hard work. And so it's not police patrol, they don't control. But beyond police at some point, they're those who control even the police. The banks that will not lend, the insurance companies will not invest, uh, access to, 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 to mass media, uh, to, 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 to development. So while I applaud the struggle against police while I'm patrolling, it's important, you know, in, in, in uh, Minnesota, uh, for some policemen that have been arrested in the history of Minnesota for killing a black. Uh, but it's, it, we, we talked with, with the uh, uh, the day before with the uh, prosecutor in the county. He can figure out that when, when uh, what's going to take over? Uh, what's his name? El Ellison. Keith Ellison, Attorney Keith General. Ellison had four of them arrested. It's a power of the vote, power of, of, of a multiracial vote. I mean, you couldn't be the state attorney general in Minnesota unless you have a lot of white votes. Uh, when when the guy was killed in Atlanta, Georgia, Paul Howard uh, uh, charged with murder. So the, the, the vote and marching feet and multiracial coalitions really do work. Vote, marching feet, multiracial coalitions really do work. They, they are three biggest weapons, really. Um, before we go, we'd be remiss if we didn't get a another word from you. We always appreciate a word from you about the importance of voting, even this upcoming uh, November. You as you are the one individual who has registered more voters than anyone in history. Um, as we go, talk to us about how important it is to keep uh, the vote front of mind and us voting front of mind as we head toward November. Dr. King said the one thing he was fired about voting was that when Emmett Till was killed and the killers testified in court, the jury knew who the killers were. They were almost bragging about doing it. They were out like 30 minutes. I would have been sure that been smoked a cigarette. There were no blacks on the jury. One black jury could have hung the jury. The, the New York Times asked one of the Jurors, why didn't you convict them? I can imagine white members of Jeffrey killing a nigger. We had no, only those who raised votes can serve on juries. Fast forward to Minnesota, I said to one of the young men in Minnesota, I said, it's, it's a registered vote. Girl, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in the system. I say, if, if George Floyd's killer came to court, would you convict him? I, I wouldn't talk out of convict him. I said, not let you raise your vote. Only the register can serve as jurors. So this thing has, has that. Uh, so whether it's the case of, uh, uh, of, of Minnesota, the case of Atlanta, well, the, the, the day before George Floyd's, the, the two before George Floyd's funeral, the black woman is now mayor of Fervis, Missouri. That's a big deal, you know. And uh, and the the right wing congressman from Iowa was defeated. The vote. 
Well, I, I had the compass call you were part of it about a month ago. He brought to his mind Black Mill from Montgomery, Selma, Birmingham, Moss Point, Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana. I don't take that for granted, man. The, 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 the vote has power. That's why, they, that's why they tried to take it from us. Because the we 5,000 black were lynched late in 1940 about the vote. Vote, vote with the passion in the side. And it will make a difference in November. Reverend Jesse Jackson, folks, uh, a protege of mine, wrote an article in the Huffington Post, I think it was last year, and the headline was, Jesse Jackson is the most important political figure in U.S. history. Brother Jahan Jones wrote that. You all should check that out. Reverend Jackson, happy 60th anniversary of your first arrest, and thank you for every arrest you've made and every time you've been arrested, I should say, since then. God bless you, Reverend. Can I make this point? Uh, Zinza Mandela died this week. My heart is so heavy. Yes. Nelson Mandela's daughter, Zinzi, a beautiful soul she was. I don't know why, how she died, but pray for the Mandela family, please. Yes, we all should. Thank you, Reverend. We love you. Love you. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, once again, one of our favorite times of the week and one of our favorite segments is, of course, Thursday Coast with the founder of Daily Coast and Civics with a Q. This is this is now my go to person when it comes to you know polls and prognostication and all of the time exclusively. Civics with a Q dot com. Marcos Melitsis joins us now. Hey, buddy. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Always good to uh, to see you and talk to you. So. Were you surprised Jeff Sessions lost in Alabama? No, no. I mean, Donald Trump has been ragging on Sessions for, what, three years now? <laughs> so four years, like his entire term. And so it was it, in a place like Alabama, which is as Trumpy a state as you can get. Uh, it was always going to be a tough slog for him. And and uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a... Um, sad ending for a sad character and and um i mean i'm not sad for him but it's a little pathetic to go from where he was as sort of the dean of the alabama political uh establishment to just sort of being tossed aside like nothing in a in a uh senate primary so do you still not see any path to victory for doug jones uh, there is a, a path to victory. Is it a very realistic one? He is, he is, you know, I'd say he's probably the most endangered senator of any kind. And there's a lot of really endangered Republican senators. So it's just, you know, it's a state that Donald Trump won by 30 points last time. He's not going, Trump's not going to win it by as much this time around. Uh, um, the whole country is tightening in a in a really interesting way. I mean, the the reaction against Trump is pretty severe. Um, Sessions might have been the better candidate to run against in a general election, just because he's so hated by Republicans that it may have split some of those off. But uh, <clears throat> the uh, the Alabama Democratic Party. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, the Alabama Democratic Party last night, uh, Tuesday night uh, and Wednesday went on the offensive against Tuberville, the, the Republican nominee. And uh, he's a football coach and they're dressing up. <laughs> <asking. laughs> they are dressing up. Account, the Alabama, that's, that's why I'm, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. The yes. Alabama Democrats Twitter account has inspired me all its own. I mean, and the language <laughs> they're speaking in Alabama, which is a college football state, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I grew up in Nashville, as you know. And when people start tweeting, Tuberville lost to Vanderbilt, that's, that's damaging in Alabama. Okay? So when I saw that, I said, oh. Because I asked Doug when he was on the show like two weeks ago, 
I said, so, man, are you going to work the whole Alabama, Auburn football thing? You know, he, Doug wants to be magnanimous and all this. <laughs> yeah. no mark. I want to keep it, you know, at a civil level. Because <laughs> that's uncivil in Alabama when you do that, if you don't know. So when I saw these tweets, I was like, and people are retweeting this. It's gone viral. Like, oh, they, like, like blood has been drawn, you know. <laughs> so, that's why yes. I'm wondering, is this some type of a, <laughs> a path to victory? I mean, it, it, it is a path. And to me, that it would take three things. One is you, you get some blood. You know, you, you peel some people away from Tuberville just on his football record. And there's some pretty good digs that they've gotten in. You know, some, I think it's striking blood. I mean, it has to be. Uh, number two is Trump's um, falling support nationwide. And Trump is still going to win Alabama by a lot. But if he wins it by 20, it's a lot easier for um, for Doug Jones, a Democrat, to win as opposed to if Trump wins by 30, right? It's just simple math. It's how much you have to overcome that top of the ticket uh, numbers. And three, and this one is going to be bigger moving forward is COVID. Uh, just on Tuesday, the governor of Alabama announced that she was imposing a statewide mask requirement in Alabama. And she's she's been Trumpian Republican, has, has fought the whole idea of COVID being a thing. Uh, and even she escaped because Alabama, which is not a big state population-wise, has been hitting over a thousand daily new cases of the coronavirus, and their death rate is at an all-time high. If you look at it per capita, they are now amongst the top states in um, as far as coronavirus hotspots, and people are going to die. You know, the Republican rank and file in Alabama—they're gonna—they're not gonna want to wear masks, and even. Kay Ivey, the, the, the governor, was like, we're not going to enforce it. We're just going to require it, but we're not even going to try to enforce it. Because they know if they try to enforce that thing in Alabama, you're going to have these a-holes with AR-15s walking around screaming about freedom, right? So um, it's going to, to remain unchecked. Next door, Florida's not even trying. They're not even trying to keep this thing under control. And you're going to export this stuff across street borders because viruses don't care about geographic boundaries. And so. Um, to me, COVID and the reaction to this now, you know, out of control epidemic in those Sunbelt states is going to have a profound impact on what happens in November. And I'm not talking just Alabama, I'm talking in Florida, in Texas, Arizona, I think is already out of reach for Trump. I mean, I think it's it's gone for the GOP, both at the presidential and at the Senate level. And people are not happy. And, and in civics, you can go. We, we track all 50 states' attitudes towards uh, the coronavirus. Uh, so you can see how in states like Texas and Arizona, um, and I actually haven't checked Alabama yet, but I'm, every other state is almost the same sort of uh, trajectory where people are increasingly disenchanted, not just with the federal government's response, but also with state government response, obviously, right? They're getting hammered. And that is going to translate into Republican troubles up and down the ballot. So does Doug Jones have a chance? I still think he's gonna be the biggest margin, the, lo the biggest margin of loss is probably gonna be Doug Jones, but the way things are trending, I'm, no, I'm not willing anywhere to say like, yeah, he's a goner. Um, Alabama Democrats, you all check out the Twitter account. And they are so good. So good. <laughs> a, a new one. All the the football uh, teams he left. Tommy Tuberville said he'd leave Ole Miss in a pine box. Days later, he left for Auburn. Never told his players goodbye. At Auburn, he had a wandering eye every year. At Texas Tech, he ditched a recruiting a recruit during dinner to leave for Cincinnati. Cincinnati. He lost the Iron Bowl, thirty six to nothing. Um, uh, he, the Vanderbilt loss, but here's one. Listen to this. Senator Jones got justice for four little girls murdered during church by the Ku Klux Klan. Tommy Tuberville thought a one-game suspension was enough when one of his players was accused of rape. Which one cares more about your daughter's fu future? So, yeah, they, they, I, that's why I asked, because when I saw that, I was like, maybe we have... <laughs> yeah, and so... 
And the thing about uh, Alabama, which is very similar to Mississippi, and if you look at the panhandle in Florida and Georgia, is that white people are overwhelmingly Republican. I'm, I'm talking in Alabama, it's probably 88%. If you're white, you're 88% likely to be a Republican. So obviously talking about this, you know, uh, racial social justice issues is critical for Doug Jones. He needs a massive black turnout, which he got. That's why he's senator in the special election. He got huge black turnout in Alabama. Um, he needs that again. So clearly he's going to be focusing a lot on those issues because white voters, he's not, he's, it's the South. I mean, white voters have a long way to go. Uh, but this is where the football sort of comes in handy, right? Because these, these white Alabamans are, are football obsessed. So he doesn't need, Doug Jones doesn't need these people to vote for him. He just needs them to show up to the polls, mark that box for Donald Trump, which is what they're going to do, and go, oh yeah, that Tumber Bill guy's an a-hole. We're not going to vote for that guy. And then move on. That's what he needs more than anything. So let me try to say this as circumspectly and diplomatically as I can. If I were in a conversation with someone in Doug Jones's camp and I said, well, you should reach out even more to the black community and black voters and women, and they were to say, well, yeah, Margo, we're in a tight race and we need some of these white voters too. Marcos Melissus might insert himself to the conversation and say, no, well, that's actually wrong because most of those white voters are going to be Republican anyway. And so don't play too much to the wrong crowd, right? Yeah, so it, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because I actually spoke with... Uh, Doug Jones, uh, top consultant before he won the special election. I ran into him in the, in the, in Washington, DC at an event. And, and so I asked him about that and I like, does he really have a chance? And the way he described it was, it was like, it was like a seesaw, right? Like you talk to the black community and then, you know, white voters are pissed off. And so they start losing them. And you go to talk to some white voters, then black voters are pissed off. And and so it's sort of a tightrope that they have to walk for sure. Now, I will say that, as we've talked about a lot in the last several years, is that white women are actually gettable, especially white educated women. And um, Doug Jones did a good job of, of eating into Republican support, into white women against the region. He had record black turnout. And white women weren't as Republican. They're still Republican, but not as Republican. That was his winning coalition. Now, in the special election, Trump wasn't on the ballot, and he was running against a sexual predator. And he still almost lost because Alabama. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a tough slog. And But he, he, he knows he needs that Black support. And the good thing about going after... after um, educated white women is that they're actually pretty good on racial justice issues. By talking racial justice, you don't turn off. Um, and in fact, while Alabama is a big anti-abortion state, those educated white women are actually very much pro-choice. So they're, it's not as much as a tightrope. If he's trying to win white men, forget it. I mean, it just ain't going to happen. <clears throat> there are over 90% Republican. <clears throat> but if he wants to peel away some of those white women, he can do so in a way that doesn't turn off the black community and vice versa. And I think that's the type rope he's going to have to walk in. And when we're talking about football, like I said, he's not trying to win that vote. He's trying to suppress it. He's trying to say, ah, that guy's an a-hole. I don't want to see his face anywhere. And that's what they're going for. And, and if it works, it'll be one of the grand political coups of, of the, <laughs> of definitely of this millennium so far, uh, because he shouldn't have been senator in the first place, and there's no way he should be reelected. So if he pulls it off, you know, it would be quite quite the feat. So it may not hurt to, to keep this an Alabama Auburn football thing uh, for women and men. It might work. Okay, Florida uh, out of control. Out of control. How those people down there, meaning the administration, the governor's administration, can even live with themselves? Um, does that well, but let me be clear. Was was Florida always in play? Is it in more play now or, or just what? So Florida was always in play. Florida okay. is always in play. And Florida 
doesn't move, right? So we, you know, Trump won it by one point. Uh, DeSantis, the governor, won it by, what, a third of a point. Uh, we lost a Senate race there. Uh, uh, Bill Nelson lost two years ago by a quarter of a point. And right now we're seeing states like Arizona and North Carolina and definitely the Midwest Trump states, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. They're all really starting to look out of reach for Trump. Florida is 50 <laughs> 50. Florida doesn't move. And you can sort of uh, you can see this sort of there's a proxy way to kind of get a sense of where Trump is in any status. You can go to civics, civics with a Q. Look at his Trump approvals by 50 states and look at his approval number and add between zero and two points, roughly. Okay. And that's how much he's getting in the head to head against Joe Biden. And if you look at Trump approval in Florida, he's at 47 percent and it's just flatlined. It doesn't move. Florida is like its own special kind of political uh, twilight zone. Uh, because we're, we're even Georgia, Georgia, you're seeing some movement and Georgia is a historically red state and Biden is he's not pulling away. But, you know, what used to be a tight race. Now he's up by two, three points. North Carolina, uh, we're seeing consistently tr- Biden's up by five in Pennsylvania. We just saw a poll by Monmouth, with the, which is the probably the best pollster in Pennsylvania, had Trump up. I mean, had Biden up by 12. Now, I'm not sure he's up by 12, but. We're in our numbers. We're definitely seeing uh, Biden pulling away in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. I, I think Michigan for sure is out of reach for Biden. Arizona's out. Of, I mean, for Trump, Arizona's out of reach for Trump. So all these states are seeing these numbers move, and Florida is fifty-fifty. And Florida feels like it will always be fifty-fifty to the end of time because it doesn't budge. And and. That's why we can ill afford some of the mishaps we've historically seen um, in in Florida as well. That's that's dangerous. There was a member of Congress, I can't think of her name right now, who said, and, and you've kind of just said, even said it just now. I mean, we can't, she even went, she went farther than me. She said, don't trust any of these numbers, that Biden is ahead and mopping the floor with him. Uh, we cannot get comfortable with that. You agree? Yeah, there, there's, and we, we've actually had this discussion before. Um, you tell liberals we're winning and they freak out, right? Oh, don't say that. Don't, don't, don't. Um, we're winning. It's okay to know we're winning. But if we want to use a sports analogy, we're, you know, it's football. We're winning, you know, 21 to seven at halftime. Does it mean we all go home? No, of course not. We got to play out the game. And I don't think there is a single liberal, progressive, Democrat, leftist, however you want to describe them, that's saying like, all right, we're good. <laughs> you know, let's call it a day. Everybody knows that we're going to have to fight all the way. We're going to have to play this out to the very, very end. And not just, and I, I don't even get the sense in past presidential elections, Mark, you know, we this has been a frustration with us that everybody sort of focused on a presidential race. And then nobody realizes that the president is one race out of thousands that we need to worry about. Right. That's not happening right now. Democratic candidates down ballot in even long shot races are raising ungodly amounts of money. Jamie Harrison in South Carolina raised, what, 13 million dollars in, in a quarter in South Carolina. Um, to give people context, what would normally be raised in a quarter in South Carolina would be about $750,000 for a Democrat. And he just raised, and that would be a good quarter. You'd be like, wow, he raised almost a million dollars. 13, that was it, 13 and a half, 13.4 million dollars. So Democrats are lit up and that's all small dollar donations. It's like, we don't have the billionaires to be bankrolling this stuff. So small dollar donations. Are, are flooding in. We're focused down ballot. We know that uh, that we need to win Senate races. And right now, I mean, I'm looking at plus five to plus seven pickup in the Senate, um, the way trends are moving right now. We have a potential to pick up up to 11 seats, a net 11. Uh, and that's me assuming Alabama's lost. You want to throw out Alabama, you know, there's, there's an outside in the biggest wave of waves to actually have plus 
12. Um, am I expecting that? No, don't, don't call this a prediction, but that's how many seats are actually in play. And they're in play in places that we shouldn't be playing. Alaska, Kansas, Texas. I mean, these are not historic, uh, South Carolina. These are not states that are, should in any circumstances be, uh, be uh, competitive at the Senate level. They are because Trump and the GOP have just so screwed things up. And it really comes down to the pandemic. I mean, it is actually going to be the death of the GOP unless something dramatic happens in the next few months. But what? What what, what are they going to do? I mean, you have this, the Republican campaign, you have uh, 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 Ivanka Trump like doing an endorsement for Goya food like on Twitter, and they think this is funny or clever, or they're not trying to win votes. They're trying to get a cheer from their deplorable base. And again, if you're, if you're losing because you're losing uh, core democratic constituencies, obviously, you know, uh, black voters, Latinos, Asians, uh, urban whites, and uh, single people, young people, if you're losing them, okay, that's one thing. But you're losing educated suburban white women. So in 2018, Democrats picked up 41 House seats. 38 of them were suburban seats. I mean, this is just to get a mm-hmm. sense of how the suburbs have flipped. How is, I, I endorse Goya, going to win you back suburban white women? How is calling Black Lives Matter a symbol of hate going to win you suburban white women? How is ranting about Hunter Biden in the Ukraine, which I guess is a thing again, how is that going to win you suburban white women? They're not trying to win votes, which is why when I say we're, we're winning and I don't see how they turn it around is because they can't run a campaign to win the votes that they've lost. They yeah. just reinforce people's doubts. I mean, if you're a suburban white woman, you are you have flipped on Trump and the Republicans because you don't like the racism, the sexism, the bullying, the tone. You don't like those things. And yet they're doubling down on that. It's amazing. They know something. And and I think what they know. I mean, I think he's expecting some more help from Putin and another trick. I think he can. So Civics just had a poll of Montana this weekend. We released it on Tuesday. Trump is ahead of Montana, 49 to 45. Montana is competitive. Montana. He won Montana by 20 points three years ago, four years ago. And he's up only by four. Alaska. It's competitive. We just saw a poll out of Alaska. And I've seen several polls out of Alaska that had it tied. Alaska, Sarah Palin territory, competitive. You have even suggested that Lisa Murkowski leave the GOP. Yeah, Lisa Murkowski is, uh, is um, yeah, incumbent senator in Alaska. She is up for re-election in two years. She voted against killing the Affordable Care Act. She voted against uh, Kavanaugh. She is um, clear, she's a pro-choice, moderate. I mean, she, she breaks with Republicans more often than anybody else. And she actually was defeated in a Republican primary uh, four years ago. And she ran as a write-in candidate and her name is Murkowski, right? So you, that's not the easiest name to, to write in. Her father though, had been Senator for decades and then he was governor for another eight years. So it's from a, she's from a big political family. And so it's been clear for a long time that she has been uncomfortable with the GOP. And Donald Trump already said that his number one goal in 2022 is to get rid of Lisa Murkowski. So there is, she is, she is the chair of the Natural Resources Committee, which is incredibly important for a state like Alaska, obviously. And and to me, there's a real chance if given a chance of being to retain that chairmanship as a Democrat or even as an independent, that's what would be more likely. She caught, she's an independent caucusing with the Democrats. That would be better than being in a minority in a Senate that is increasingly likely not to have a filibuster next year. And Democrats at this point, the Democrats are going to pick it up. And I think the filibusters 
toast. Even Joe Biden finally came out for eliminating the filibuster. And so does she want to be in a minority with no power? Does she want to remain in charge uh, in a state where she actually won in 2000 uh, or four years ago? So 16, she won on the strength of Democratic votes because Republicans were voting for the Republican nominee. And it was Democrats saying like, uh, that guy looks crazy. I'm not, you know, let's vote for Murkowski. And it was a good bet for Democrats. We got some really key votes from her when we needed to. And to me, it seems like a no brainer for her to, to switch because Republicans are going to primary her again. Donald Trump's going to go on a war path. Can you imagine an unemployed Donald Trump in 2022? So, um, I mean, who, the guy's so unhealthy, maybe he might not even be around. But um, I have no doubt that if he loses uh, this year, and I think he is, that he's going to run again in four years if he's still alive. I mean, that dude's not going away. Hmm. Wouldn't that be hard? <laughs> think about that. That's impressive. <laughs> um, you said also that he's the worst thing to happen to the GOP electorally since Richard Nixon. Yeah, I mean, just on and the numbers. This is one of Marcos's latest piece. I mean, he's quantified it, how much the Republican Party has lost since he's been in office. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. I mean, he's lost ground in the Senate, but the Senate was the the it was a very favorable map in 2018. But still, you know, they've lost ground in the Senate since 2016. They definitely have lost ground in the House. You know, they're they're down over 40 seats. And uh, that's despite the fact that the Senate or the House has, has been gerrymandered to benefit. Republicans. So it'll be really interesting after this reapportionment, how those districts get re, re, uh, redrawn because Democrats now have a much greater say in, in most of the key states in the redistricting process. Um, <clears throat> in the state legislatures, I mean, you've seen dramatic realignment. You know, I think it's three, four hundred state legislators have uh, have flipped to Democrats from Republicans. Uh, governorships. I mean, it, it used to be, and you might have the numbers in front of me, I don't have it in front of me, but there used to be something like 38 to 12, and now it's 26, 24 Republicans in governorships. 33, 16 in 2016, Re- Republican to Democrat. Now it's 26, 24. I mean, it's almost 50 50. Yeah. Know, so three years. Yep. So, that in a lot of those governorships have been critical governorships in states like Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, uh, oh my God, state legislators. Nevada. State yeah, legislators, Marcos. Listen to this, you all. Um, in 2016, 4,121 Republican state legislators to 3,164 Democratic state legislators. In 2019, 3,834 Republican state legislators to 3,442 Democratic state legislators, a pickup of 278 Democrats. And that that makes a difference in redistricting, does it not? It makes a difference in, first of all, it makes a difference in just legislating. Everything works. Yeah. And, but it also makes a difference in redistricting. And a lot of those pickups have been really heavily focused on states where we have uh, used redistricting as a reason to rally fundraising and attention. Um, their ability to redistrict is severe or to really draw districts to their advantage is severely hampered. And here's the thing is that redistricting is not just the U.S. House. It's those state legislatures themselves. So by blocking them, and what happens when you, when you, in some of these states, we actually can write our own districts now, but what happens when you block, even if you can just block them, you have one chamber, like in Texas, we need three seats, I think, in the state uh, house to take control of the st- Texas state house, which I'm really confident we're going to do that this year. We can block redistricting. So what happens, it gets thrown to a judge and a judge will always write fair districts and will always take a fair district over a Republican gerrymander, and, and it dramatically changes the the math, both 
at, again, at the federal level, at the U.S. House, but also in those state legislatures themselves, because uh, you have a state like Michigan, Republicans have super majorities and had super majorities in those chambers when they lost the popular vote in 2018 in those state legislative races. That's how heavily gerrymander they are, right? They they make Detroit one big district, you know, one district, um, and then uh, and then draw themselves. It's 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 gerrymandering, and so the ability to block those gerrymanders is going to dramatically change the, that that um, the shape of governance into 2030. That's how important that has been. It's something we've been focused on for the last four years. It's definitely something that that um, it's going to be a critical. Uh, consideration this year as we choose where to focus our state legislative uh, dollars. And, uh, but it also means just policy. I mean, you have trifectas, democratic trifectas in states like Virginia, right? What do they do? They, they just voted to get rid of all Confederate statutes, right? From the symbolic to the practical on things like choice, like things on, on assistance to low-income people. Uh, these issues matter. We won the governorship in Kentucky, right? Blood red Kentucky. This is a state that Trump, again, won by about 30 points. You had the governor say, we're going to extend, uh, we're going to extend our, uh, our universal health care to all black families. Thing, you know, it matters who we elect. It's a, literally a matter of life and death. I mean, you look at Democratic led states and Republican ones now, not in the initial crush of the virus, right? When it just hit us from, and nobody was prepared and people didn't even know how it was spread, right? We had three months to prepare. States like New York, New Jersey with Democratic governors, they got their, you know, they got their, you know, stuff together. Like they, those states have Connecticut, their rates are low and you got to watch it. It's dangerous, it's scary. But then you look at Florida and Arizona and Georgia and Texas, where these uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Oklahoma, where the Oklahoma governor now has COVID, <clears throat> where ideology trumped science and people are dying and thousands of people are going to die, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, because from Trump on down to those governors, they refuse to listen to the science, to the experts, because that sort of core Republican ideology. It's finally out in the open. It's, it's overtly racist. It's anti-science. It's anti-good governor go governance. And obviously we're seeing what those repercussions are. And that's why I think Trump has really crushed the Republican Party. And so in 2018, what was the 2018 campaign for Republicans? It was Salvadoran gang members. Remember those like there was just three Salvadoran with all the tattoos looking Mr. fierce and scary. And that was their 2018 campaign and the caravan from Honduras. Oh no, the caravan. They got their asses whooped. Like people are like, we can handle, that's okay, right? The fear mongering didn't work. I don't even know what their campaign is in 2020. It's, it's, it's Confederate statues and Goya beans and something about Hunter Biden where, you know, Trump on Tuesday or it's Hunter Biden. Like, is there a single person in the world that's wondering where Hunter Biden is, except maybe Joe and Jill? <laughs> you know, why hasn't Hunter called, right? I mean, maybe, maybe. Um, it is, it's, he can't even focus. They try this Obamagate thing, right? They're, you know, and, and Republicans have an ability when they get their right wing machine focus on something, they have the ability to turn it into something like Hillary's emails. But they don't even know what to talk about. Because Trump's all over the place every day. And so they can't even come up with a message that they can run on. So it's just this mishmash of nonsense and racism and sexism. And they look at Joe Biden. And I got I to gotta say, um, Mark, that I disagreed, obviously, with Joe Biden getting the nomination. But Black voters made this very conscious, deliberate choice to pick the most boring, non-offensive in racial and in sexist terms candidate possible, right? The old white guy, like we're, because we don't want to threaten this relation, you know, this this race anymore. And everybody else, it's going to be more of an issue if they're a woman, if they're black, uh, if they're Latino. That's that's dangerous. Let's just pick the boring white guy that everybody knows 
And obviously I disagreed with that decision just on, on ideology. Right. But Holy shit, is it paying off? <laughs> it really is paying off. They don't know what to do with Biden. He's sleepy. Uh, no, he's, he's creepy. Like they, there's, they can't really go to their sexist and racist. And that was all deliberate, right? Black voters knew that. Like it was, it was clear in focus groups and in polling. Like this, this is not an accident, political accident. This was a conscious decision black voters in South Carolina and elsewhere made to pick the guy that Republicans would have a hard time running against because they wouldn't be able to resort to the racist and sexist tropes. And it really is working. They haven't laid it. And and COVID's been great, right, for Biden because it forces him to not campaign, which the best Biden is the Biden that's not speaking publicly, (laughs) which is a sad sad (laughs) truth. (laughs) But, and then Republicans are frustrated. Did you let Marco say that it's best for him not to campaign? I'm, I just can't. It is, I'm just accepting. It, go out, do scripted events like he just did his <laughs> his 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 release of the climate change plan. A plus, you know, he's he's solid on ideology and policy. He's definitely moved to the left since the primary. Right. He's sounding he's sounding more activistic. Right. It's not no longer talking about going back to the status quo because now we all know the status quo kind of sucked. Yeah. On climate change, on race relations, on right. income inequality. Yeah. Um, lastly, he's running an ad in Texas, and that's gotten big news. How competitive is Texas? Texas is competitive. The uh, this is one of those states that if you were go to if you were to go to civics and you would look at Trump's approval number, and then people's. Uh, feelings towards uh, the federal and the state response to the COVID crisis, they're all dramatically shifting. And as Trump's approval numbers drop, like I said, it's almost directly correlated. In fact, I think it's directly correlated right now. I haven't found an exception where Trump's approval numbers match his uh, his um, share of the of the of the head-to-head vote against Joe Biden, and. Trump was like at 55% at the beginning of the year in Texas. And I think right now he's at 47%, which still means he's around 49% of the head to head, which means he wins. But it's, it's, it's like this, right? His numbers are going down and that's the, that's the, um, that's the difference. If the election was today, Trump wins. I mean, I'm not good, but it's the way the trends are headed. And the fact that Texas is just getting slammed both in new cases and in deaths. I mean, they're averaging triple digit um, daily deaths at this point, and those numbers are gonna get worse and worse and worse. Uh, So yeah, I absolutely think Texas is competitive. And uh, not only is that important for the presidential, and I wanna just kind of keep stressing this so people realize it, it doesn't even matter if Biden wins Texas. The fact is we have a chance to win the Senate seat in Texas with MJ Hager. And she has a better chance to win if she only needs 5% of Trump voters to not vote or, you know, or split their ballot, as opposed to if Trump was winning by 10. I mean, that's the key. It's how do we get these down ballot candidates over the hump? We also need to win in uh, state legislative races so we can we can have a say in redistricting. That's a big factor. So, and you have competitive congressional races, both defending some seats we won in 2018, and there's a couple new up, pickup opportunities as well. All of this is tied in. So the better Joe Biden does at the top of the ticket, or inversely, the worse Donald Trump does, the better our chances are of us to have this massive wave election down ballot. So absolutely, Texas should be fought. Yeah. Uh, no, we, it, it, it absolutely must be. Folks, we must be competitive everywhere. It ain't over yet. Stay motivated. Check out dailycoast.com, civics with a Q, uh, dot com. Uh, things are looking up. We want them to stay that way. So, yeah, in, in 2018, we had this sort of same debate, right? The polling right. looked really good, and the, we don't want people to stay home. And, but they didn't, right? Because now the motivation is, oh, God, we need to, like, we, we can't let Trump win. The motivation is, how do we create this dramatic shift in our nation's politics by just wiping out the GOP? from top to bottom. We have a historic opportunity right now to take what has been four years of absolute horrid 
Trump governance and make some good out of it, like pull something, that silver lining that says we dramatically transformed our nation's politics. That's what's on the ballot this time. It's not whether we get rid of Trump. Trump, I think, is gone, absent shenanigans of uh, it's how deeply we can deliver pain to the GOP. And we, like I said, it's it's looking really bleak for them. Let's throw that anchor. No, you said uh, throw an anchor, but not a lifeline. Now, you didn't realize it earlier, you, you uh, Freudianly said, oh, Biden, a little earlier in, in our conversation today. And that's not uncommon. But <laughs> we had this opportunity in 2008. And, you know, Obama, student of Lincoln, threw a lifeline. So when everybody, because he, he, he could have been vanquished then, the party. It was electorally done then. And... Um, this time, though, you all heard Marcos. Even if it's President O'Biden, we need to make sure that this is an anchor, not a lifeline that is thrown. I just want to emphasize that point. Because we already have them. As I said, y'all, and I've said it before, too. Sometimes we repeat ourselves because repetition is key to people getting it in their minds. Fox News is repetitive vis-a-vis their propaganda all the time. So repetition in media makes a difference. So I've said this before. Mm-hmm. Um, that we have a multi-party democracy within the Democratic Party. So we just need more than one party. Well, let's just break up Democratic Party like they broke up Ma Bell. And let's have a women's party and a labor party, an African-American party. And we'd have them all. Just have all these different, I mean, I would be totally fine with it if that's what will make people feel better. But we do not need a party of exclusively for the benefit of rich white men, which is what the Republican Party is. Note I said rich white men, because some of y'all poor white men stink, think it's for you and it really isn't. That's the point Reverend Barber has been, he's been doing what he's doing, trying to get that in y'all's head. Some of y'all still don't get that. There's my party. No, it's not. So, <laughs> um, and that's why you're down of COVID. That's why your jobs aren't coming back after COVID. Yeah. Right? So, I know everybody can't handle that right now because you're caught up in the Confederate statues because you think that's going to, food on the table and pay the bills after COVID. I don't know how, but we, we need to, it's a, it's a distraction from that reality. And it makes you feel good somehow. I don't know, but yeah. anchor. And I'll it's, make it's the Marcos now make the argument. We can't have one party democracy. Okay, well let's do a monopoly breakup of the democratic party and just have everybody in their own party. And then when they all come together, when it's time to come together, no big deal. And we're you know, going to agree anyway. If you want to have a Republican Party that says we should spend less or there's market solutions for some of these issues, great. But anti-science, you know, Jennifer Rubin is a Washington Post columnist and a never-Trumper conservative. And she just wrote a piece where she says, you know, just destroy the Republican Party. It's done. It's broken. We need a party that has solutions for climate change and race relations and income inequality. And I'm like, yeah, it's called a Democratic Party. <laughs> It exists. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, that's the party that cares about those things. But if they want to come up with a with a new party that, that just says less government involvement, we say now the government's more involved. Okay, great. That we can have that argument. We that's but what we have now isn't a ideological we're not even arguing with facts anymore. Like we are fact based, they're not fact based, they're cue based. And that's that's not a that's just not a party anymore. It's not worth saving. Datacoach.com, civics.com with the Q. Marcos Melissis is always here with us every Thursday for Thursday Coast, and we have fun doing this. Thank you, buddy, as always. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. All right, you too. God, you are our refuge. Send our ancestors to guard our doors. Cast out this virus from our communities and our bodies. Heal, bless, and protect everyone listening and their loved ones. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been Made Plain.